have been part of every political solution proffered independently to make Nigeria a better country for the last 30 years. Nigeria has only been around for 58 years. I started in 1989. In 2019, I've been engaged fighting to expand our democratic space. I'll be fighting against corruption so that we can end poverty. I'm fighting against ignorance so that we can give our children education. I'm fighting against men and women in this country who are stealing so that it can be enough for people who are hungry to eat. I am telling you that I have history. I'm unique in that way. There's no candidate, even some of the older candidates, some of them who call themselves retired army generals, retired custom officers, who can say that they have independently served this country the way I have in the last 30 years. And that is why I'm unique. And this is the reason why I can stand in front of anybody and say that I'm, I will be, this country will be better off in our hands instead of the hands of the Bucaneers that put the country in the condition that it is today. Okay, so um, your activism um, from your student days to date, as far as you're concerned, is your unique selling point. Before we sort of focus and have a conversation about that work that you've done, what qualifies your running mate to become the vice president of Bucaneers? Okay, rubbish that I said it was really angry. Could you speak Brothers up? and sisters, comrades, friends, wherever you are, very good evening to you. Good evening for hosting us. You've asked a very important question, but when you read my CV, I couldn't even recognize myself. Um, I'm here not as spare part or as spare tire to the, you know, party, African Action Congress. Uh, Shore has actually done well in moving the Take It Back movement, which transformed to a political party, we are now contesting for this uh, post. You realize that uh, there is no better story to tell than to tell our own stories for Nigerians to vote for us, which is the real story. We represent the largest constituency in this country. This is the seventh geopolitical zone, you could call it, but it's a social, actually, so you're talking about age here? In terms it's of not the, about age. It's okay. what the Nigerians you know, are suffering from for all these years. We are a generation that our leaders have let down seriously. No opportunities for school, for hospitals, for roads and other infrastructure. And you realize, actually, when you want to study uh, or you want to help slaves, you don't ask the slave masters or the slave ship captain. You ask the slaves themselves. And that's why we are here to salvage Nigeria and our teeming population that are yearning for good governance and good leadership in this country. You know, you have seen it all over, you understand. Our party came with the best of the manifestos, that is the spice I hear, because at the moment you realize that Nigeria is testless. If it is full, you can't take it, because there's nothing there actually for us to be proud of, having been let down. Yeah, you, you talked about your manifesto, and I, and I will, you know, we'll get a chance to sort of go Absolutely through the details of what you're trying to do. But I, I want to come back to Mr. Showere and specifically um, focus on the activism. The activism, um, we know you were in university, spent six years, fought military junta. There seems to be a little bit of a gap in terms of your public history. And so I'd like to be able to fill that gap for Nigerians. You were at university, you graduated. Not much is known between that period of graduation and you setting up Sahara Reporters. What did you do? So I entered university in 1989. I graduated around 1995, eventually, after I was brutally attacked at the University of Lagos and injected with an unknown chemical substance. I then was delayed after I graduated, they seized my result for months. And I was mobilized to go to NYC, and I did my NYC in Yola, Adamawa State, between 1995 and 1996. And after that, I was arrested and detained by the military junta under a bachelor after, on the day of my passing out parade. And I spent a week until a newspaper reporter at the Punch, not an edition, I think Stanley Yakub wrote his story and I was released, because they put me in a guard room in, an, in a detention center, chained to the ground. And then after that, I left Yola, went back to my activism. Uh, by 1998, I led one of the most popular struggles after I left university, called, you know, disrupting the Nuga Games on behalf of students who were expelled by the military at that time. Mm -hmm. And after that, I became a little sick and traveled to the U.S. Uh, in 1999, before the elections happened in 1999. And I've been in the U.S. 
since 1999, and now it will be 20 years since then that uh, I've been away. So the, 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 I mean, people talk about you coming, um, you know, from a sort of, I've heard talk about you being a poor fisherman boy, and now there is some allegations or there are talks that you're worth something like $10 million. <laughs> Your net worth is $10 million. And I'm trying to close that gap to try and understand how do you go from sort of being locked up, running into exile, and sort of 10 years later you founded a media website and you're worth $10 million. Because, you know, Nigerians have issues with leaders who talk about integrity but don't have it. And so it's, it's good to establish these things. Well, thank you. It's true that uh, I grew up poor. I, I was fishing for my entire family at nine years old. have a dime in my account, <laughs> uh, except contributions from people who are supporting this campaign, because I had to leave Sahara Reporters and I cannot be paying myself while I'm doing this. So I don't have that word. But Sahara Reporters is probably worth more. Let me say this to you, no, when reason, you are innovating. Let me, let me explain why yeah. that is important, because yeah. as I understand it, you hold an American passport. I don't hold an American passport. Okay. No. I have never changed my citizenship since I left this country. Okay, so the, the, I have a Nigerian passport and I have a green card, right. which is ever changed my part, nationality. Part of the concern that has been expressed to me in sort of researching um, this particular program mm -hmm. is um, this particular program mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. the idea that there might be some sort of foreign influence behind you because of me for Sahara from foundations and all of that. No. Uh, when we walked in here, you introduced yourself. You said this is funded. You know, so I have also been funded. Sahara Report has also been funded by the MacArthur Foundation before. It doesn't mean that someone has a foreign influence. You know, people have foreign people who have to pay 1.1 million naira to get a U.S. visa just to visit for two days. People with foreign influence. You know, people with foreign influence. People who are helping Morocco to join the West Africa ECOWAS simply because they want to get money on the side to run for election. Those are people with foreign influence. I have absolutely no foreign influence. If there's any influence on me, it's the conscience of the suffering people of this country. Mm -hmm. And that's the influence that will drive us to victory. Okay. Now, <laughs> this, this question is for both of you. And even though he's known as the activist from your initial answer, yeah. I got the sense that you are also quite driven. Ah. Um, the criticism I've heard against you is that you thrive on sensationalism and uh, controversy. And the concern is that Nigeria is actually really right, very fragile right now. Mm. Whoever becomes president needs to have the qualities of a bridge builder. Mm. People don't see that in you and maybe to a lesser extent also in you. What would you say about that issue of needing someone who will heal and who will kai, 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 kai. In this race, who have been to 33 states across Nigeria in the last nine months. We've been to places as remote as Kebi, Zamfara. I've been to Shokoto. I've been to, to Bayesa states. We've been in states like Akwaibom. We've been in some states that most Nigerians have never been to before, and we've been received. We were in Taraba last week. We were in... Uh, at Damawa last week, and in all of these places, we get acceptance, we get great reception, and people are saying, look, this is our brother. We are the greatest build bridges, um, sorry, build bridges, uh, uh, bridge builders you can find in this country today. I have never met uh, Dr. Rufai before, but when we met it as if we were brothers, and we were wondering, what is it that has been dividing this country for so long, if so, people can so, get together, uh, 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 together. Program last week, somebody raised the question, but I don't think the president or the vice president did justice to it, which is the issue of uh, the Almajri carnage or pandemic, because it's a serious problem, not just health wise, but security wise. In the last administration, I'm sure probably maybe his cabinet from the north, because it's only you have to be a northerner or a Muslim to actually. Uh, appreciate the problems that has to do with the Almajri. So your, your question is, what is the okay, solution? Yeah, to the what Almagri? is the solution? What, yeah, what, what plans do they actually have 
to abolish the system completely and not handle it with kid gloves or any sense of sensitivity. Thank, Thank you. you very much. So um, the first question is about creating wealth yes. so that our population... Anyone, we start with you. Um, okay, I, I have to take a quick break, and then when we come back, we'll start with the answers to those questions. Yeah. Don't go away. Stay connected on our YouTube channel at www.youtube.com slash NCA News Online. Watch our live stream at www.nca.ng slash live. NCA, you can't beat the rich. Yes, it be like say they want to tell us another story again, yo. Now so, you know say, if you would say I'd be superstar. But for me, the real superstars are those people where they go vote for the candidate of their choice without violence. So for these upcoming elections, be my superstar. Vote. No fights. No violence. Because the election will be won. We work together so the future will be brighter. and the Nigeria Television Authority with the support of the MacArthur Foundation. We are in conversation with the presidential and vice presidential candidates of the Africa Action Congress, Mr. Yeheli Showere and Dr. Rufai. Now, a quick reminder that those at home can actually take part by sending questions using the social media handles that are scrolling across the street. Those in the diaspora were told there are slight problems with the streaming, but we are doing our best to fix it as quickly as possible. Now, before we went on break, there were two questions. One was on uh, growing wealth, and I think uh, the second question was around the Almagiri. So maybe if we could start with the one about growing this country's productivity and wealth. Yes. Thank you. Uh, welcome back. We've just been told that... Uh, uh, people can't hear us, so we hope this technical glitch will be fixed so that we can interact. I have with just people. been told it has been fixed. Yes. yes. Uh, so with regards to population, uh, we've passed that period in the history of mankind that population can become a liability. Some of the fastest growing nations in the world today, China and India, are relying on their population to become wealthy. But without investments in our population, we can be wealthy, even if we are five people in Nigeria. The truth is that we are not investing in the areas that can make our population become productive in a way that we can turn them to the new resource that can make Nigeria become a prosperous nation. We are not investing in education. We are not investing in health. We are not investing in technology. And certainly, we are not investing in infrastructure and human security. And it is this investment I wish that this question came after we were spoken about our own Spicer hit that the VP was talking about. That is talking about 10 areas of intervention in Nigeria's institutional life under our government in which that human resource of Nigeria, because oil is lazy the economy, ladies and gentlemen, oil is not the future. And definitely it is not the way we are doing things now that is the future. It's our people, the Nigerian people, okay, who are so, out there so let's, let's, who will make Nigeria town hall co-production between Daria Media. Yes. How much do you reckon um, you will need? What sort of budget are you looking at to be able to hire 200,000 teachers immediately, 160,000 health workers yes. to boost power from, did you say, to 17,000 megawatts? Yes. megawatts yes. Um, and all of the other things that you've listed in your agenda. I want numbers. Yes. And how you intend to raise the money. So with regards to power, to get us from the miserable 7,000 megawatts to 24,000, adding 17,000 I mean 17, megawatts, mm -hmm. we are expected to invest about $10 billion. Where you and $10 billion dollars will come from investors who are interested in making their money the same way we had investors coming with telecommunication companies. And in one year, MTN took out $13 billion out of this country from profit. Mr. Yes. Let me tell you. 
politics here, and I'm, I'm trying not, to get into details you asked with me you. To be specific, yes, and, and so, I'm being so the, specific. the point I'm making is, under this administration, yes. for example, yes. and the previous administration, yes. power was privatized, all apart from the transmission network. Hang on, distribution as well as generation. Yes. And we had private sector people coming. Yes. And so I'm trying to understand how does your plan differ from what we have currently. And I'd also like Dr. Rufai at some point to jump in because under the constitution, as VP, he's also head of the Economic Council. Yes. So I'd like to get a sense as well I want, from him. I want to correct the impression that power was privatized. Power wasn't privatized. They, sold, they wanted to deregulate and privatize the power sector. They did the privatization, they didn't do the deregulation. They built their own generating stations so that we can have power. They didn't have one. We sold what belonged to Nigeria at under the market price to the same people who then turned around, got subventions from our government, and that was how the PDP spent $16 billion generating darkness in this country. This government has continued the same thing. So when, when, you, when you claim that you want to deregulate and you don't deregulate so that there's no competition, okay. and you say you are privatizing and you are giving to your friends, okay, so, you are so not going to you have come in, power. You come in today. Yes. What are you going to do? I have said it, and I'm repeating here again, that we come in today, we are hooking up solar panels for quarter, we are creating you know, solar farms that will generate 4,500 megawatts of power. We are going to do 90 uh, uh, kilowatts per university, right? And we are going to do solar farms across the country for 500 megawatts each. It takes less than, you listen to, please, if you listen to me, I'll deliver this to you so that Nigerians can hear it. It takes less than a year. It took Egypt less than two and a half years to do 14,000 megawatts at 500,000 naira per megawatts of power. It's the cheapest in the world. Here we can even do it cheaper because we have plenty of cheap labor to do it. I'm not saying we are going to abuse, abuse labor here. And it's the same Siemens who came to Nigeria trying to do the same thing. And people were asking them for bribes that went to Rascom, a state-owned power, power, generate, I mean, power company in Egypt to deliver the same. This is public information. You need leadership here. We don't have it. I'm trying to understand. That's the problem. From, from you a, need innovation. From, from we don't legal, have it. Because we do have a power act, I'm sure you know. That what? We have an, a, a policy and a law that has deregulated the sector. Well, I'm telling and you I'm, that I'm, there's no deregulation. And I'm, and I'm, because... trying, I'm trying to understand from yes. the point of view of someone who becomes president, yes. because you will have to work within the law, and I'm assuming that's it. So I'm trying to get a sense of, so for example, if you say you're going to build solar power plants, yes. are these sol solar power plants going to be owned by government? Who's going to give you the money for that? Those are the kind of questions I'm looking for answers and, for. And I have answered it partially, that it happened in Egypt, it happened in Morocco, and there are people who are looking for places where they can build power stations, make their money, and let people enjoy so power. So you're just going but to open create... up the market, basically, of course, what that is saying. what the regulation was supposed to be in the first place, mm. is to give license to people who come and generate power, not to sell what belongs to the Nigerian people, to friends or politicians, and then give them subventions. And now, when there's even 3,000 extra to be, uh, to be evacuated, they don't do it because it doesn't bring profit to them. It is a cannibalistic system of power generation that is killing us. And people who are in the power business can testify to this. I'm telling you that we need leaders who are courageous not to face these people who are making it impossible for Nigeria to make progress. It's not an argument between you and I. It's an argument about the future of our people. Dr. Rufai? Yeah, thank you very much. I would like to make some of the points here made uh, even clearer and louder, and then also dwell on the question on al Majri system. Um, you will recall in 2011, there was a Fukushima nuclear disaster in Japan. It's an energy-driven country. They almost went flat because of what happened. What happened? They invited a German and British company to go and they fix it within one year. So it's doable. Nigeria can generate 12,000 megawatts in a year if the right incentive is given, the right sense actually, and the courage and the sincerity from the side of government. 
And I don't like this pessimism that we really have to get stuck in this conundrum for any longer. Believe you me, when Siemens came to Nigeria wanting to sign PPP, that's public-private partnership to create the solar, Nigeria turned them down because of graft. People were asking for bribe, and that's the norm in this country. They had to go to Egypt, and then they got 14.5,000 megawatt in a matter of two years and at a cost of 7.5 billion US dollars only. So at least when it's not uh, really serious, but we are a serious party, we are courageous, we are determined actually to change the status quo. Now, you realize that economy is not leaves from tree that we could pluck, we really do to, to do the work, we are going to leverage on the modern day thing, which is ICT to improve our economic output and production. Mm -hmm. You realize that California now is one of the richest part of America and richest part of the world because of the IT giants that are there, Google, eBay, Amazon, and so on. Nigeria also has to catch up with these, actually, because gone are the days, and that's why our party came up with this vision for Nigeria that really be internet-oriented. And sometimes they call this chap homo internecticus, that he's no longer a homo sapien because we are really interested to bring apps, to bring coders into Nigeria, okay. to develop our people. In healthcare, it's now the in thing. People create uh, clinical decision support system, apps that help our diagnosis to go better. Okay, let me, let me, let me go straight into your manifesto, because I yep. think you know, the details that I'm looking for, I can find in there, and then maybe yes. we can have that conversation. You said you need an annual budget of about $500 billion. Oh based on your manifesto, yep. to actualize your plans, which include recruitment of teachers, health workers, etc., etc. This is uh, as opposed to the current Nigerian budget, which is between 35 to $40 billion. Um, and I'm just trying to understand how your economic plan is planning to increase this budget tenfold, almost over just a four-year period. What are the funding sources, for example, outside um, PPP and all of that. What exactly, how are you going to find 500 billion Thank in you. a country that we know is suffering from uh, uh, a lack of, if you like, productivity? No. So, just so that we correct it, we have a Under number of projects that we would implement over four years. And we're looking at how much it will cost. Okay, so it's not period, a budget. It's this not is a budget. The cost this, of, the, the annual budget of Nigeria is around, it's been consistently about $35 billion yeah. uh, per year. Mm -hmm. Nigeria's GDP is around $500 billion naira per year. So what we are saying is that there are a lot of opportunities for us to increase our revenue, and we'll do so by, you know, of course, ensuring that all the leakages that are there with corruption and waste and mismanagement we get rid of that. That can save us $5 billion. Just let me finish there. And when we go next from there, is how we can actually increase the collection of our taxes. The collection rate of our taxes is the lowest even in the African sub-region. And right now we're at about 7%. Ghana, our neighbor here, is about 15%. What it means is that we can increase from what it is now, which is about 6 trillion naira, to about, you know, uh, 10 to 15 trillion naira when we are effectively collecting taxes. We are not increasing taxes. We are just collecting company income taxes. We are ensuring that all of the tax categories are adequately and efficiently collected. Okay, so and, how, and how will you give tax breaks to stimulate growth for small and medium businesses if what you are talking about is increased taxation? I mean, Increasingly, you are seen. Let me finish. Taxes. Let me finish. We you, you, collection rate of taxes. When we talk yes. to a lot of the people who support you, yes. they see you as the candidate of the common man, yes. of the citizen That's who's right. been disadvantaged over the years. That's right. And yet here you are talking about increasing taxes. No, that's not correct. Yes. No, I did not say we increase. Okay, taxes. let me. I misspoke. Not increase, collecting more taxes. No, well, yes, yes. Collecting, collecting more, more taxes, taxes from people who otherwise... Let me explain to you very quickly what I mean by that. Okay. There are a lot of companies out there today who are deducting taxes from their workers and pocketing it without paying to the federal government. Mm -hmm. That is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. yeah. As a reporter, I did an investigation 
recently, mm -hmm. and found out that most of the companies that are in Nigeria, including the big companies, breweries in particular, some of them are supposed to be paying five billion in company income taxes. They are only paying 800 million because they have friends in those sectors that can help them hide the books. Why do you think Lagos is doing well? It's because they decided that it is time to be collecting taxes. What they do with the taxes and who it goes to, you know, as part of the party, big, big men, is a different issue. But at least they are collecting the taxes. And if they were to be spending their taxes on the citizens, Lagos would probably be El Dorado by now. So, That's so, what so, so there's like no increase in taxes. Some of your plans yes. seem to be very similar to what the APC is currently no, no, doing. I, no, They've I, increased tax collection. No, I, I rebooked that. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Tunde Fowler, for example, yes. the man in charge of the federal inland revenue, yes. has spent the last two, three years doing exactly what you've said should be done, which is getting people who normally don't pay taxes to pay, mm. persuading those that have taken wealth abroad to start paying taxes on their um, assets, etc., mm. etc. Et and so, again, the, the issue is trying to get clarity mm. regarding why your drive is different from what they are currently doing, which has actually seen an increase in, in, in collection of taxes. And Lagos that you give an example of, obviously, is an APC state, and everybody's taking a cue from them when it comes to taxes. Well, that's, that's exactly what I'm saying here, is that our own plan is different from theirs, because their own plan is tax collection that is funding special interests. Our own is tax collection that is funding the people. That's exactly the difference. You know. So I don't want to mention Tunde Fowler's name. I don't know him well enough to know how much taxes he's collecting. But if the APC is a party that we know very well, they are probably not collecting taxes from people who are in the APC. They are going after people who are owing taxes who are in other political okay. parties. That is the trait of the APC. That's why you know, I said You know this is not a the debate. Comparison. They're not here to defend themselves. Yes. So let's focus on your Well, they, they, they are watching us, trust me. And their ministers were here with you last week. So uh, we watched them last week. We hope they are watching Let us this time around. Let me quickly ask, too. Dr. Mm. Rufai, a, government, a question that has come from someone and it's related to what we're talking about. Mm. Amamata Suleiman writes and yeah. says, how do you plan to sustain the salary package of 100,000 of minimum wage mm -hmm. that you have promised. Yes. Amamata Suleiman. Maybe Dr. Rufai can oh, answer that question. Um, I, I like the question, and this is not going to be anything near or close to what APC you know, does or is doing. Yesterday, they passed uh, through the Council of State 30,000 uh, 30, minimum 000. wage. 27, what we have, 27,000, what we have is actually not. Uh, a minimum wage or a living wage. That's why we put it to 100,000. And you realize if you can help me do the math, an average worker is likely to spend at least 1,000 naira for feeding mm. on a daily basis. Mm. And then to transport himself to work and then to have some savings for healthcare and then utility bills. Now, food, if it's 1,000 and then so you multiply it by 30 So by your calculation, this is what is required, is what but, you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. By your calculation, and, this is what a worker and, requires. And that's what we aim to achieve, actually, right. because it has a, uh, a kind of uh, positive feedback mechanism, a multiplier effect. Mm -hmm. When you improve the w wages, that in itself can control some level of corruption because you now disincentivize people to be tempted to, corrupt them, to be corrupted by people or vested interests. At the same time, this is the money they can actually use in sending their kids to school so that we can have a better Nigeria. These are the monies they can use to what access health care services, health as well. The healthier they are, the better they will be productive economically. And if you now put this together, you realize it is really important that we keenly look at these other countries that we are almost at the same level with them, middle income or lower income countries actually are giving their workers higher wages than Nigeria. South Africa, for instance, is 136,000 naira compared to Nigeria. So even the 30, uh, 100,000, we said, is for the beginning of our what, term. Okay, let, time me, let, me, get... let me ask you if you've done the math in terms yep. of how much of an increase that is. Absolutely. It's a percentage increase of 456, mm -hmm. which means you're going to see uh, the federal government wage bill 
basically increased by almost two trillion mm. a year. Mm. Um, and that means we're looking at an increase that will take the yearly wage bill to about 9.1 trillion. That is the math. Mm -hmm. If we go with what you're, what you're saying, a, based on what the federal government pays that's, currently. That's, that's actually not correct. It is correct. Okay. Please do the numbers. Yeah. Well, we've done our math, that's what I'm saying. Yes. yes. That is correct. Yes. Well, from from, from, from 18,000 to 100,000 mm -hmm. is an increase that will mean you will be paying an extra 7 trillion annually. Well, that's, let, on, let, I, on I, wanted to, I wanted to jump into that so that uh, we can get this accurately to Nigerian people, right? Uh, there are about 890,000 federal workers. Mm. That number, due to corruption, is bloated to about 1.5 million workers at the federal level. We are going to leverage on technology to get rid of the 500,000 ghost workers. I'm telling you that. That's the truth. Okay. And what it means is that um, when you are coming to work, it's either when, your when fingerprint you, when, when or your you retina a, scan no, when you throw that admits you to like the that, office. Mr. Showere, yes. when you throw a figure out like that, yes. you need to be able to tell Nigerians how you arrived at the fact that you are sure Nigeria we, has we 500,000 ghost workers. Yes, no, no. We have been talking to, we have been talking to labor unions who know of this scam. Even the Nigerian police, I think last year, found about 80,000 people who are ghost workers in their system. The former minister of finance found that there are 10,000 workers on the payroll of the federal government in the railway sector. No, I'm not arguing no, that I'm, we have, we have we ghost are, workers. We are, we are I'm doing, not arguing. We are doing mathematics Dif now. No, different, which not, different, yeah. different, different governments. But I want, but I want no, to... No, hang on, hang on. Different yes. governments yes. at different times. Yes have come in and have sort of exposed the fact that they found ghost workers, including the current government and the one before it. Yeah. What I'm asking is that you seem very clear and very emphatic yes. about the numbers. Yes. You said you believe there are 500,000 ghost workers on Almost. the federal payroll. Wage yes. Yes. payroll. And yes. I'm asking, yes. what is the basis for arriving at this number? It's completely, that's what I'm just telling you that we've been investigating and we'll be giving you direct information that are even coming from government officials themselves. But to how much it will cost, you know, because the increase that will happen is going to be for about 70% of the federal workers on, on federal payroll, you know, minus the ghost workers, okay, which that's the first thing we do. We're going to push them with technologies. If you don't have your fingerprint recognition, you can't get into a federal office under our government. If you cannot do retina scan, you can't get into office. And when you are leaving, we'll be able to tell if you came to work and when you left work, because your eyes will reveal that or your finger will reveal that. It's already happening here. There's no reason why we are not doing what other smaller countries are doing. But coming to the cost now, we are looking at about 1.5 trillion naira. That's what is going to be added to the federal uh, which bill. So these are your numbers? Okay. Yes, We have a 7 own, million, but you're saying based on the ghost trillion, workers. Yes. Okay. That's because we are, we are dealing first and foremost with federal workers. And what we have discovered is that if Nigeria is losing, that, that's the most equivalent of about one point something billion dollars. Mm -hmm. If Nigeria is losing so much money, right, to corruption and we plug it, you know, we get rid of ghost workers, there will be enough money to pay workers at 100,000 naira, you know, per head. But let me tell you something about even the current increase that they've just done. Uh, yesterday, that which is 30,000. Do you know how much the federal government said they are adding to the federal wage bill? About 24 billion. That is the cost, according to their own records from the budget office, in which I read a few days ago. So it's not a lot of money. 24 billion naira is less than what the APC will use for their rallies in a few okay. states. Let me, but let we me, don't want to pay workers because we don't care about, about workers. Okay, you know, this is federal. Yes. So the chances are, if that happens at the federal yeah. level, um, we've, we know from experience that before you know it, the workers in the states yes. also start to agitate, agitate for yes. an increase. Yes. And some states are not even economically viable. And so what is your um, view and what are you going to do regarding the states? Because Have you thought about that? So whatever it is we increase at the federal level in terms of improvement in taxes, revenue collection, 
stopping wastage, corruption, and mismanagement, is going to go into a pool, a federal pool that will be shared to the state. So the higher, the more money we make at the federal level, the more money the states get. The reason why states are not paying workers is not because they don't have money in most cases. It's because we have irresponsible state governors. And I hope the I, states I, will I, vote I, them I, out in this election. Absolutely. Even should, President Buhari Joey, said it. I, that they gave Paris here, and, and, and I'm, I'm again mm. listening to you. And again, you're sounding like other governments that have been here. No, no. Nothing, no, let me no, finish. No, no. Let me finish. This issue it of... It sounds like you don't no, want to no, give me no, no, the no. opportunity... Let me ask the question, then you answer. Express yes. Let me ask Empirically, the question. No, no. How, how we're solving this problem. How we ask the question, yes. and then yes. you can answer. Yes. I say this because here we are with someone who's talked about restructuring. Yes. And then we're talking about taking money from the center and sharing to states again. At a time when Nigerians are saying, we need to look at how to make states viable yes. so that they can stand on their own. But your solution in terms of wages for workers is that the center will save money and distribute it. It sounds very familiar. It is not familiar because even when you restructure Nigeria, you are not going to leave the states at the behest of the you know, restructuring without catering for them. There's still a lot of constitutional provisions that have to be made on how states can stand on their own. Look, people who are shouting restructuring okay. are not taking into consideration some of these things. And that's where we are different. That's why we are not just jumping into the restructuring argument. Mm -hmm. And the people who are talking about restructuring are not interested in restructuring. They have a party candidate and a party they want to support to come back to power. That is what restructuring means. And now that they have found their candidate, are you hearing about restructuring anymore? But here is what I want to tell you about how we need to make states to be productive. There's a state called Kebi State, right? And they are growing rice. They said, and I cannot confirm this, so that when you are fact-checking me, that they made 150 billion naira. There is no state in Nigeria that can make up to 4 billion naira from the federal level, even on a monthly basis. But the truth is that a state that became creative and innovative growing rice is making enough money to take care of its people. You know, Under and, a program pushed by the government, by the federal you, want, government. To so you when, want to replace. That's, that's yes. what you're saying. When you're saying that... So they're doing well. Are you no, giving them they're a doing well. They're doing well because there's a government at the center that cares, but the state is also using the, its own innovation to make its own money. We've mentioned Lagos before, even though they are doing wuru wuru with whatever they are Did making. Did I just but, hear you endorse an APC government? No, 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 no. No, we are, there's no APC government yes. anywhere. We are talking about things that are working with we, Nigerian people's money. The, cent the money at the central bank is not APC's money. It's the pe money of the Nigerian people. So if we are using it and directing it to... So the farmers in Kirby State, they don't carry APC and party cards. They are innovative, hard-working Nigerians mm -hmm. who have always been rice farmers, who have been abandoned, but when they got the necessary boost, they are working to do what they need to do. So don't make it sound like it's an APC idea. We are talking but it about is. how it is not. If, in fact, if you look at the APC manifesto, you can't find, uh, you can't find growing of rice there. The, it's true. And, and There's the, nothing and, and, in their manifesto the, that says we grow rice. The, they the, are just doing the, trial and error. The, anything the, that works, it the, says they are, the anything that doesn't work, they attribute the, it to the, someone else. Okay, all right. Yeah. We, unfortunately, I'm going to have to take a quick yes. break, and oh. we can carry on when we come back. Okay. Don't go away. Welcome back. You are watching the candidates, and we are in conversation with the presidential and vice presidential candidates of the AAC, Mr. Shoei and Dr. Rufai. Yep. Um, I'd like to get uh, members of the Before audience you. engaged and ask a few questions. So the yep. lady in front here, we'll take maybe four, and then come back to the candidates. Lady in front here, the gentleman in glasses, uh, the one right at the back in the cap, and then the gentleman in the suit right here. So... Let's do the four and then come back to the, um, to the panel. Yes. Good evening, Nigerians and the, the AAC presidential candidates and his vice. Okay. My name is Princess Hali Majubri. I am an integrated marketing communication professional and good governance, women and youth advocacy. My question is still on power. And I have every reason to take you back. And I'd like to remind you that power 
is on the exclusive list of the federal government. And that you should know that the privatization that was done was based on that premise. And uh, power drives industrialization. It drives security. It drives youth employment and underemployment, women's health, child mortality, and the general health well-being of citizens of this country. And it also drives tax collection because the cost of running business in Nigeria is higher than anywhere in the African sub-region. And then I put it to you that you have not accurately explained to Nigerians how you are going to tackle power that is on the exclusive list of the federal government because you haven't said that you are going to remove it okay, from there. Thank you. The next question, please. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Good evening, distinguished Nigerians, candidates of uh, the candidates on the podium. You will agree with me. My name is Shegun Awosanya, a random ordinary citizen of Nigeria. You will agree with me that a few misconstrued social constructs must be redefined historically, holistically, in our policy for Nigeria to thrive namely education as against indoctrination, erudition as against loquaciousness, leadership as against showmanship, and finally, success as against self-genocidal toil for unsustainable quick wins or gains. Let me put this to you. How critical will strategic alliances and unsustainable social reengineering be to your administration, if considered at all. Okay, thank you very much. The gentleman here, yes. I hope you're taking notes of all the Yes. Uh, good evening. My name is Ike Deze Ike. I'm a project manager and IT consultant. Um, my question borders on human capacity development. I want to ask, AAC, what plan do they have for young Nigerians? Uh, today, the United States is doing well because they invested so much in their human capacity development. Uh, we see little or nothing from governments, from the previous government, current government, in developing people, developing the youth, developing the, the minds in Nigeria. So what do AAC, what are they bringing to young Nigerians Thank you. in relation to government aided skill centers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The last gentleman, then we'll come back to you. Uh, good evening, Mr. Shore. You mentioned something about the current government. What, what is your name, sir? My name is Olapade Akim, an economist. You mentioned something about the current government by growing rice, and I wanted to know that. Currently in Nigeria, yeah, it's not only KB state that grow rice, but in, of course, and some states in the southwest and the rest. And just because the government said we are running mono economy, which is oil, we need to diversify. From diversification, we got to see the boost into rice. What else being produced in Nigeria that you think, as a government, if you are given opportunity, that you too can boost? and produce. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, a few questions there, and um, okay. I, I will add a few more that oh, are mm -hmm. kind of related, okay. so that maybe you can combine Let them me. from people at okay. home. Um, Alonso Adanjuma says, Mr. Shore, what plans do you have with regards to our educational system? Okay. Having spent 20 years in the U.S., where there are foremost tertiary institutions, as against Nigeria, where our education has gotten so bad. 
um, because you were asked about youth empowerment. Um, the youth, Mr. Nee Daniels, says the youth of our country have been neglected over time. A bill for an act to establish a youth-driven organization, Nigeria Peace Corps, was rejected by the president. Um, would you have dealt with this differently, or would you have done the same thing? So let's look at those, um, okay. Okay. those Let me questions. Let start responding to some of the questions uh, somebody had already asked, and then also to give uh, something about the restructuring bit that you talked about. It is in our own interest, and of course the interest of wider Nigeria, that we look at economic restructuring, not the restructuring whereby political actors who want have opportunity to really emasculate their people. You realize that there is a culture of perverse incentive in this country, that even when the states are bailed out by the federal government, they ended up actually investing the money where it shouldn't be. Look at our markets in all the states, I think, almost all the states of the federal there had been fire incidences claiming actually millions and billions of people's but, but you, property. You're contesting for, for an office of president and vice president. Yeah. As far as I know, mm. your party doesn't have a lot of candidates contesting to be governor. Yes. And yet, you know, you seem to be talking to me about to the, the role of state governors. Yes. There's not much you can do about that, we, even we, if you are president and vice president. You, you can actually because leverage there's... on their competitive advantage, actually, to provide them with incentive to grow and, and partner. Look at the state you come from, Zamfara. There is no local government in Zamfara state, 14 of them most, most without gold deposits. What is the state doing, actually, in order to, you know, bring out these resources? Some states have opportunity for tourism. So I'm trying to understand how at the center you can influence the way a state is governed because I'm still not clear you what, you're, fair what you're saying exactly. When the state actually runs to Father Xmas every time they're in trouble and that you could not have some you know, policy networking with them even if you don't belong to the same party actually to work for the common man, that is what our interest is. Actually to see that the states on their own are more productive economically so that they can take care of their problems and their issues. And the quickest way to do that is to help them with strategic decision makings in the way they undertake their duties. What if they say no? Oh, come on. In this country, the poor will really vote them out of office. I agree. Because it disheartened me when you see serious investment that could be done and could improve the economic bits of these states that are not being taken. Those radical decisions have to be taken. And we have some candidates at our own, in our own party. And that's what we came up and that's what we are you know, interested in doing. Now let's begin to talk about some of the questions asked. The, the there issue is of... There's one, actually, yes. somebody mentioned that al majdi system, and I can tie it to the education sure. system. Uh, you realize that there are, according to statistics, it depends on who you look, almost 13.5 million children, actually, that are out of school, and majority of them are even this al majdi system. And I thought this government... Uh, Professor, Professor, uh, President Muhammad Buhari is from the north, Muslim, uh, would actually do something about it when he came to power. Mm. And he did nothing. He turned his back against them. And I understand that there's only one problem you can solve with no action, maybe alcoholic hangover. And I don't drink. So, okay, so definitely what are you going to do? we will that's, really that's... take them off the street. We will really inject 200,000 teachers to teach in our primary school the education at the primary Where, school level hang is... On, hang on, let me ask you a specific question. Where are you going to find those teachers? Teachers? We have seen... Yes. Yep. We have seen that there's a dearth of skilled teachers. Teachers, yeah. Um, in the last few years, we've seen states mm -hmm. actually test yeah. even the ones that are in school mm -hmm. and find that they are not competent. Yep. And where they've actually tried to recruit... Mm -hmm. Some of them have had problems yes. getting people who are qualified. Mm -hmm. So if the you say to me, we... as soon as you enter office, you're mm -hmm. going to recruit 200,000 teachers, mm -hmm. the first question that comes to mind is where are you going to find them? You realize that we somehow, um, like, take, when we see a problem, we take back steps and say, okay, see no evil here, no evil, talk no evil. Teacher education. These teachers can be put to good use when you incentivize and then you put a lot of resources actually to re-education of the teachers as they go. So it wouldn't be an immediate thing. Then you of, first have to re-educate them before the, you employ them. In our, in our recruitment process, selection and then their distribution, we really have to be keen on what quality they have. 
But there are a lot of Nigerians that are roaming our streets that are not employed, and they have the certificate and the right uh, aptitude to teach in our primary schools. What? And the Quranic school education, you realize, actually, there are a lot of uh, ulama actually, that are keen, actually, to see these children being reabsorbed into How a formal teaching. How much money teaching. will you put into education? Look, if Nigeria would go, which it's unlikely, actually, broke one area that I'm sure everybody would be interested to put his last cobo is education and health care. Yeah, but I'm saying... Because when we did our research, yeah. Nigerians across all the regions we've been to, they're interested in having a good health care system and then education, education, education. When they met Shuori on the road, Makaranta, Makaranta, that has always been this. this okay, so, so again, I, and, I, you know, I, it's want a public a specific, good. I want a specific number. How mm. much money will you commit to putting into education if you are elected as president and vice president? Yeah. So, uh, so, we have uh, done our work, our research, and it's going to be in two ways. The first is, of course, the normal budgetary process. And the next is, of course, the planning process over time. For instance, the 13 million kids that we have been talking about, and when you fact check these people, different figures pop up from different areas. We discover that with an average of 100,000 Naira investment over four years, you can take them, all of them out of school. As a matter of fact, the Universal Basic Education Act makes it a crime not to send children to school in this country. And most people don't know that a president of Nigeria could be impeached if they don't allow kids to go to school because it's a constitutional provision uh, of ours. What I'm saying here is that 1.3 trillion naira over four years, you know, taking kids out of school. Special intervention funds are there. We have an education tax that is line follow, always. You have states that are supposed to match grants from UBEC funds that refuse to do this because they don't send their children to school here. He was mentioning President Buhari and so Amajiri. The reason Buhari it? doesn't care about Amajiri is because his children are not Amajiris. He doesn't so, send his children so, to school here. So yes. So what I'm saying here so is that... from a practical point of view, are you going to have a task force that's going to be on the streets taking children off the streets, putting them into school? No, what no. are you going to do? Look, when I was growing up under free education in Ondo states, there were task forces taking us out of school. I mean, out of street if you don't go to school. And they are in two ways. There are parents who are around looking for kids that don't go to school. They will drag you by your hair and send you back to school. That is how our African moral society operates. Of course, the war against the discipline once captured me on the street and took me back to school. But don't say that I'm endorsing Buhari's... <laughs> yes, no, I'm just telling you that you can actually have the police do the job of enforcing the UBEC Act. Okay. By when in the How US do you deal and in the UK where you live, if you don't send your children to school, the police is going to come after you. Okay, so there's a it's re just a matter of ensuring that they get the mandate and they get the memo that it's a priority to let children go to school, and they don't go to school, it becomes a law enforcement issue. There's a religious, <laughs> there's a religious aspect mm -hmm. to the Almajiri yes. problem, mm -hmm. because a lot of the parents whose kids end up on this street actually send out their kids to get what they consider an Islamic education. Yes. So what will you do about that particular aspect of the problem. You know, because they're parents who feel they're sending their kids to get an Islamic education. Yes. You know, I understand that, that very well. And I do not discount in us religious education. But what I'm saying is that there is a way we can innovatively also let these parents know that where their kids are learning in our primary schools, they can also get Islamic education. It's a matter of bringing the teachers from Islamic education classes to come into the mainstream educational system. Look, you know, in so some you're willing to do that. Oh, yeah. absolutely. I, I studied Islamic education. It was one of my classes, even in Nondo State. Mm. And Bible knowledge, mm. you know, and also Ifa, and all these things. We need to just let our curriculum be open minded enough okay, wait, to wait, accept the time is very little, all so let's of move this to the audio innovation. Now. And yes. the guy who is an Islamic teacher, on the same salary as the guy who is teaching science, they can match very well and be happy. What about the issue of power that was yeah. raised and the fact that power is actually on the exclusive list? And um, in discussing your plan, you didn't 
talk about how you're going to get around that problem. Uh, the, see, that's an in, the interesting thing about Nigeria. So power is on the exclusive list, which means that the federal government has absolute control over power. But when it is time to sell assets in the power sector, it becomes a private issue. In fact, people tell you that business, government have no business in business. Mm. But when it is time to pay for to power companies, power that they supply, they give the invoice to the federal government. I am interested in ensuring that there's power. Whether it is exclusive or inclusive, whichever list it can belong to, as long as the, as, as the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, mm. I can light up this country. Mm. It will be a legislative agenda that I will discuss with legislators at the National Assembly that, look, the most important thing is not the language in which we couch where power belongs, mm -hmm. but how our people can get electricity. Mm -hmm. That is what is most important to me. You know, but what I'm saying here, mm -hmm. and I, I, let me land, mm -hmm. what I'm saying here is that this idea that we are deregulating mm -hmm. and privatizing a sector that suddenly is also still in the exclusive list, and the federal government is not supposed to say anything about it, is the oxymoron of the power sector. Mm. It's not oxymoron in my view, it's abracadabra. Mm. They don't want there to be light in this country. We have paid for it. Where did the 16 billion naira that the PDP spent on power come from? The federal government. Yep. But nobody is holding the private sector responsible for darkness. It's the federal government that is responsible for the lack of electricity in this country. The federal government better guide it loans Recover what it needs to recover. What our people need is light, not excuses and where it belongs. And, and, it, against, sounds, and it sounds great. You know. but, but you know, um, it, hang on. Um, it sounds great and populist and you'll get your applause. Mm -hmm. But when you're in government, they're practical. This is, let, let me finish. This is what they always me, tell us. I'm mm -hmm. going to ask the question. Mm -hmm. There are practical issues. There are rules. There are policies that guide these things. And to be able to change those rules, you must either go to the National Assembly or find a way to get people across. And so her question is still valid because the federal government remains in charge. And so when you talk about deploying farm uh, solar panels and all of that, there are real practical things to be dealt with in terms of who is allowed to do what. That and that is really her question. How are you going to get around that particular fact. But that's what I'm saying. It is still the duty of the federal government. The federal government is still the authority in charge of granting the power for people to generate electricity. It is still the federal government. It is still the federal government that is in control of the TCA, what they call the Transmission Company of Nigeria. So the federal government has not lost the power to power up Nigeria to the extent that I should be sweating about the legislative concerns about that. We have enough power as a federal government to light up this country. We've looked at the laws, we've looked at the rules, but the rules that nobody wants to talk about is the people who are sabotaging our ability to generate electricity, and as a result, we can't industrialize. Our children can't go to bed to do their, uh, their homework because there's no light. We cannot have an economy that is built around darkness. That is the truth. She said it that in this country, the cost of production is the highest because we don't have electricity. Let me ask you a question. Yes. What are your thoughts on the current complaints about low tariffs from the supply side? Um, will you address steady power supply first or will you increase tariffs first? No. Because, you know, there's that issue of what comes first. Is it the chicken mm. or the egg? Mm. Because the current distribution companies argue that they are so regulated that they cannot charge what is uh, a commercial rate for power. And that basically stops them from being able to invest and be able to do what they need to do. So I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. <laughs> so the interesting thing is that it's a very simple issue. There's a consumer who is the demand side and there's a supply side. Do you know what is driving tariffs up? is because they want to collect more than they are supplying. Mm -hmm. Just come and give people prepaid meters. Mm -hmm. An average household in Nigeria consumes about 6,000 Naira electricity per month. 
But the power companies, being the greedy people they are, want to collect 20,000 naira from you. If they take their 16,000, I mean 6,000 naira per household or per meter, they still make a profit. They so make let, let me ask huge you a specific profit, question. But you cannot continue, let me say this, you cannot satisfy the greed of people who are not interested in getting satisfied. And that's where government comes in. Mm. It is not the matter of regulation. Go and ask the, you know, the power ministry now. The minister of power is looking for a third party to supply meters, mm. prepaid meters to consumers. Because they can't get these greedy power suppliers to make it available, even when they're available. Why? Do you know what will happen? At the end of the day, the cost of those third party involvement will still be transferred so, to the consumer. Whereas, so, if you so, don't have special interests who sponsor you to office, mm. who are your godfathers, you just have to be government. You take a stand and you say, sir, every prepared meter out there must be given to consumer. And if you are not, there are people, plenty of people, yeah. who are willing, and I mean it, willing to generate power, willing to supply power for 6000 naira per household, make enough profit let, for let, me, let me, and then me, everybody will be happy. Yeah, but ask, it makes, you, you're making it sound like, these things are difficult, but no, I'm looking I at it from the point of view of what is easy to do. I am, I am trying to understand the practicalities of what happens if you are elected and tomorrow mm. you're president of Nigeria. Because it's you not already going to be tomorrow, have... it's going to be February 16th. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and um, you're president and there are these distribution companies, they're already in place. Yeah. They've bought all these assets. Mm. They're responsible for distributing power within certain areas. Your location yeah. has their location. Mm. So I'm, I'm trying to understand from a practical point of view, you, you get into office, what exactly is going to happen? And if, I'm not sure I'm clear. No, I'm, I'm very clear that the day I get into office... What will be your relationship, for example, with the, with the distribution companies? Are is, you, will you be seeking to take away... Their, their distribution licenses, any, what will if, you do? If some of them are not even carrying out what they have licensed to do, we cannot continue to pamper those ones. We take back their licenses. If you are not distributing, you don't, you don't sit down on a license and refuse to carry out the service for which the license is met. That is where the regulation was supposed to have. That was why I discussed the regulation earlier. If these license owners had been the ones who are generating the electricity, they would have been eager to distribute it. But because it doesn't belong to them, and they got it they at home. Huh? They buy it. They buy it. They buy it from the generation They didn't, they didn't buy anything. These guys, were, they dashed it to them. Some of them are going to jail now. <laughs> no, it's true. You know, some of them have been arrested for how they duped banks mm. to buy these things. We gave them subventions. This country gave them trillions, I mean, almost a trillion naira subventions after we gave them the power sector generating companies at under the table, I mean, under market value prices. I mean, I have been involved in investigating these things. I'm just telling you that probably that's the reason why they will sit up. I'm not going to do any body language. Disrupt everything. That's it, what I'm hearing. Is, why won't you disrupt criminality? That's the job of the executive section. Yes. It's the job of president. If there are criminals taking advantage of your people, do you just sit down there and say because? Okay. Final question before <laughs> yes. we go on break. Yes. Part of the problems that Nigeria has, particularly with investors, oh. is that people believe Governments don't respect agreements. Mm. You have one government come, do a concession, give a license, agree a contract. Another government comes and disrupts it. Yes. And this has um, a serious implication for confidence. Mm. So those investors that uh, you keep wanting to attract, the PPP that you're talking about, get a little bit wary of this country because they think people come and they change things. It sounds like what you want to do. No. Do you know why those kind of PPPs are difficult to deal with? Because when they have a president that is called Fortunato, collecting bribes, you lose your integrity before partners. But this is the most important thing you must understand. There are international agreements governing investment in every country. We have discussed MTN taking out $13 billion. If 
Sahar reporter hadn't exposed it. The federal government would not have asked them to bring back the money. And when they did, what did they do? They went back to the door. We're only getting 80 something million naira back from 13 billion naira that they took away illegally through the Central Bank of Nigeria. That is criminality. You and, know? and that is what we are going to disrupt. But you knew, and you knew that what did they do? They went to judges to be looking for injunctions. Whereas they are supposed to just respect an agreement not to take money illegally okay. out of we, this we, country. We have, you do it in the we US, have to be careful you are going to not jail. to libel people. Yeah. I know you are used to be sued. Yeah, but, no, can they, can sue me. <laughs> they can sue me. They can sue me. I'm a presidential really candidate. You can sue me I am before going the election. Take because after the election, I have immunity. Very quick break. Stay with us. Watching the candidates brought to you by Dario Media and the Nigerian Television Authority with the support of the MacArthur Foundation. Now, before the break, we'd started taking some audience questions, and there were a few that we'd not um, yes. dealt with. And if we could quickly before we mm. enter the next segment. So, there was a question around what your plans are for young people. Yes. Um, and then uh, your plan for uh, human capacity. And finally, there was a question around our culture, I think, and our sort of mindsets. So maybe if we could deal with those really quickly before we move into yes. talking about security and a few other things. Well, with regards to young people, there are two very important things we must do for young people in this country. is to invest in their education, mm. and then after they get out of school, to find them jobs. And our party, our uh, mandate will provide over 5 million jobs, and we're very specific about that that in the past sector alone, we're looking about to provide you know, almost two million uh, jobs, you know, especially as we invest in a mixed bag of, you know, sources of providing power, electricity in the country. In the security sector, where we need a massive infusion of uh, personnel, we're looking into providing almost 200 to 300,000 jobs, you know, getting more recruitment into the police, the army, uh, and other security agencies that we need to keep us secure as a country. Uh, we are also going to invest in education in such a way that we'll revive every available scholarship that is out there for young people, for students. Uh, we have looked at the number of students in this country, and we think and believe that we can afford to even give study allowances to students. And I know you are going to jump at me as to where I'm finding. You know, let me let me let me say let me finish let me finish. And you know, I have been in a country where I wasn't even a citizen, the U.S. And before I be sorry, before I even got my paperwork normalized at Columbia University, I already had student loans. I had what they call Pell grants provided for me as a student the to Nigeria, the extent that I could pay the, the American, my rent. The American and I am not, so I'm just is saying that huge. It is, it they is don't huge. rely on but one you, source of you, income do you like know, we do. Do you know that the American, price of oil is not you know, crashing all we of have that, always, so. We have always used, we're sitting down here giving excuses on behalf of people I'm who are failed. I'm not giving failed. excuses. I'm trying to get you to I explain to Nigerians. I am trying to, to tell the Nigerian people that with the judicious use of their resources, what you want to do. Yes. This is I'm the telling question. Nigerians that with the judicious use of their resources, we can support our country, we can support our young people, we can support our children, we can support our elders, we can support everybody. There is enough to go around. But when you continue to feed the greedy, the needy will always suffer. You cannot satisfy the greedy minority in this country. And so let me you ask are, you a specific let me, let question me, let, about that I want, I want to jump in no, no, with one more no, no, thing. Quick question, quick question. Yes. The National Assembly. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the institutions that Nigerians generally, when you talk to, believe are overpaid yes. and utilize a percentage of our resources that is way over what it is. This is that. What are you going to do about that? Exactly where I was coming to. You know, and this exactly answers the question of people who are earning minimum wage and people who are earning maximum wage. The National Assembly, a senator in Nigeria is earning 14 million naira. This is not, I didn't make it up. Mm -hmm. If you are earning 30,000 naira, the, their own minimum wage, or the 28,000 naira, 27,000 naira they approved at the Council of State yesterday, mm -hmm. it will take you 38 years 
to make the salary of a senator in Nigeria in a month, a monthly salary of a senator. It takes a Nigerian worker earning 30,000, 38 years to make it. It takes a professor who is earning 450,000 naira per month, almost 10 years to make But here, you don't like it when I say that there's money for the poor. No, I want to you know, know what you, you want to me to explain. It. We're saying our problem is not wet generation in Nigeria. It's wet distribution. <laughs> That's our problem. So we are circulating our wealth in the, in the hands of just a minority. Okay, so there are two issues you've yes. raised here, and yes. I'd like you to quickly deal with yeah. them. Again, time is a factor. Um, the first is really trying to understand how, as president, you will get the National Assembly to review... It's not um, about... What, no, no, because at the end of the day, they make the laws, yes. right? So the, and the second issue is that you, you, you talked about this. Are you saying you are satisfied with our productivity level in this country? Because you keep saying our problem is not wealth generation, it is wealth distribution. We, we, um, so are you happy with our no, productivity? The productivity will happen when we invest in our people. Mm. When we invest in education, when we invest in power. You know, we have a port, a national port that can expand. Mm -hmm. But it also has become a basket case. So you are there pouring water into it. The National Assembly is taking its own. The subsidy people are taking their own. Until you plug that, you have a whole port, and the port can expand because now there's power, there's productivity. You have students who are going to school. And you can then be looking into a future of a knowledge economy, where information, because that's what I want to get to. Somebody asked me here before, you know, what other products can you do after rice? No, I'm not after cocoa or gold. I'm after the knowledge of Nigerians that we can sell into the future. You know, because if you look at even the stock markets of major countries in the world, it is not cocoa and rubber that they are selling. They are, you know, Amazon is there, you know, uh, Microsoft is there, Apple is there. If you invest in our universities, FUTA can produce one student, that is the Federal University of Technology in Akure, or the one in Mina, can mm -hmm. produce one student that can innovate to the extent that we can have a Facebook founder in this country yeah. that, will be, that will be ruling How the world. How will you and, persuade and, the National Assembly to yeah. cut down So on the National that. Assembly, going to their own case, there is no way we can accept an illegality. The allowances they are paying themselves, according to even the laws of the law, are illegal. Mm. They are not entitled to more than one million naira or thereabouts in allowances. So the mere fact that somebody has taken over the lunatic asylum mm. and is awarding himself, mm. I mean themselves what they like, doesn't mean that it is legal. We can challenge it. Yep. We have a court in this land which we can challenge and see how much are they entitled to, how much should they be collecting. If we cannot get them to drop it, the country might as well drop them. Okay. That's the truth. Now let me quickly, because the time is limited, Dr. Rufai, um, security. Okay. Nigeria is facing multiple challenges on the area of security. Uh, we are fighting an insurgency in the northeast, Boko Haram. We have bandits and rustlers in the northwest. Uh, we have a little bit of uh, issues with farmers and herders in the central part of north central part of Nigeria. There's still a bit of restiveness in the east with um, organizations like IPOP talking about. Uh, Mm. you know, breaking away and forming Biafra. Mm -hmm. What are your plans for securing Nigeria? Oh. Well, you actually highlighted the fact that we are dealing with hybrids of criminal elements here and there, from Boko Haram in the northeast and then down to the Niger Delta and the agitation of the IPOPs and co. Uh, you realize that they have something in common, all of them meaning there's some sort of complacency at the center where the generals, the police uh, at the helm of our security have not been actually doing very well to what they are assigned to do. And then if you now unpack other security challenges like the hardest and the farmers clash has its own uniqueness in, in some ways. So you really have to break down what sort of security challenge is and then to actually develop an innovative solution towards it. But the first is actually to know that Nigeria will do better, we will live in peace and progress when we don't condone anybody's crime because he belongs to a certain tribe, creed, religion or anything. We really have to have a way of 
bringing people accountable to their crimes, whoever they are. If you take the farmers' hardest clash, well, we only have to reflect on what is happening in the Sahel. They have always found themselves in the middle of the desert. They don't have water, bodies, and so on. But they still produce their economically prosperous to some extent. No killing like the scale we have in Nigeria. So you realize in Nigeria, for us to solve the problems of herders and cattle, we need to actually change the way we do agriculture. We need to adapt to the climate change and the issues around it. And then, of course, last time, I'm sure you saw the video if you did your homework well. The, the Fulani issue you made in Taraba and Jalung were asking Shaori, when are we going to have schools for our kids? When are we going to have a better uh, you know, system to take care of our cattle who are tired of being killed and so on? Then he said, well, it's the commercial ranching, which has the potential actually for these herders to actually access animal sciences product, meaning the way they could propagate faster and better, they can graze, and then, of course, to get veterinary care from the government at some people, and then some PPP with interested people, actually, we can actually have commercial ranching. These are likely to fatten their cows to produce more, create a value chain along that that can feed us with milk, and there you have more prosperity. Agree, we don't have dams, infrastructure are very but few. I, I am so sorry to keep doing this to you, but that is exactly what this government is proposing. What? Ranching. Oh, the government is the, the government but have is they tackled proposed... the adaptation of the climate change? They didn't mention so it. I'm just, I'm no, just no. pointing out. The government is proposing grazing corridors and cattle colonies. colonies. And they ranches. are different from commercial mm. ranches. And ranches. No, I'm not aware. I mean, mm. no, look, you had a hectic time interviewing the president and yeah, the DPD at that time. So maybe <laughs> there's a problem of understanding of what it meant. You know, we, we went through that, yeah. So what... They are saying is yeah. that they want grazing corridors, mm. they want cattle colonies. Mm. We are proposing commercial ranching, mm. in which case somebody can own a ranch. There are 20 million cows mm. roaming around in Nigeria. Mm. And you find out that because they are even roaming around in ways that are not productive, they hardly can produce milk, and most of them are suffering malnutrition. Mm. If you keep them in a ranch, they will be fat cows. Mm -hmm. You know, and anybody can go into the business because the cow meat business is a three billion dollar industry. Yeah. You know, that we have not tapped into. But beyond that, there are droppings, mm -hmm. the cow from which we can generate over mm. one thousand megawatts of electricity. So this is what innovative leadership is about, not these analog leaders who are talking about the past. You ask the president here last week, with due respect, <laughs> about how to solve the... He never mentioned commercial ranch. I watched him. The, the VP did. Yeah, oh, no, the that's way. why I'm saying the, what the VP, VP knows they about Nigeria and what the president knows, they are two different... You know, me and him... <laughs> we, yes, it's true. <laughs> Going by what we saw here last week, there is a miscommunication between the VP and the president. Go so it's a bifurcated presidency, <laughs> but our own will be one. Okay. Yes. Go, go for her. Boko, Boko Haram. Yeah? Boko Haram. Yes. Yeah. What is your solution? Solution to Boko Haram is direct. Every 10 years, any local insurgency of any kind must be defeated by country. They usually last next the gestation period of insurgencies of that nature. But the problem with Boko Haram was that the moment it transmuted from being a crisis to a business, there was no way it was going to end. As a reporter, I was the first person who was reporting that army generals were not buying the equipment, they were not paying their soldiers who were in the front lines, and I was derided for it, that it was because I didn't want the other party to win. Eventually, how many of the generals were arrested, prosecuted in the army, in the navy, in the air force? But you know what? When they got to the army, the record of the prosecution disappeared. Okay, so when, if you become president, will you, will you so, arrest and prosecute army generals? Absolutely. You know, I have said not only will I do that, any army general that has been involved in fighting the Boko Haram insurgency will be asked to leave peacefully the armed forces. Because that is not a general that can win a war. But when you keep them around, the president said it, I think it's on Arise TV, that he realized that some of the army overstayed their usefulness. 
But to today, so we'll he has not fired them. He has not relieved them of under, their responsibility. Under a show president, yes. we'll see a purge of the army, oh, taking I'm, out the... We, 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 that is something that you do from time to time. It's natural with people who are, you know, sometimes even without corruption, fatigue sets in. Mm. What we have found out in the armed forces, instead of allowing the younger, well-trained officers to take over command positions, the older ones, the corrupt, you know, big fat ones don't leave, even though they don't leave Abuja, but they have refused to allow promotion of people who have been trained because they don't want them to become progress, they don't want them to make progress within the armed forces. And these are the guys that are willing to wipe out these guys. But the ones that are making money off of it, they don't want the Boko Haram insurgency to end. Okay, That's I will take two quick questions on security, just to wrap up this section. Um, okay, so the gentleman here in the black suit with the blue shirt, please, sir, go to the mic. And then the gentleman right at the back. Yes, sir, just, yeah. just come. Because we've literally got five minutes. You need to be quick. Yes, good evening, Mr. Shawaret. Because of time, um, I want you to tell Nigerians uh, how differently will you want to fight corruption because that has not been tackled on this podium. Okay. That is a remainder. Then, two... No, 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 no. Sir, no, sir, no. So, please, could, could you have respect okay. for people, please? Thank you very much. Uh, there's five minutes to go, sir. So, how, how would you tackle? Uh, my, name, my name is Caleb Terry Nikwa. I'm the gubernatorial candidate on the platform of African Action Congress in Benue State. And over and over, this question gets thrown to me, the issue of um, hazemen and farmers' clashes. Yes. And the VP answered a part of it. But the issue is that even in commercial um, ranching, you need the people to give the land. Mm -hmm. The problem down there is that people are not ready to give the land because there is now a tussle and emotional and cultural clash between these two people, forcing them to give out the land for commercial, they, they perceive it as you are trying to force them to be defeated in the war. Okay. So it's an emotional so, so, yeah, issue. So how, how do you, you tackle that? that? Thank you. Okay, and, and I'm going to add a final question, yes. and if we could end on that, then we'll go. Um, you were quoted as uh, saying at an event that um, you want to legalize marijuana huh. and make it a commodity that can generate money. I'd like to understand what you said, whether you were quoted, whether it's a question of legalizing it for use domestically as well, or whether it's going to be legalized just as a business for export. Okay. And it, um, you've got literally a minute. I'll answer that first, because I know it's very important. Uh, we are legalizing it for export. It's, okay. There's a huge market out there uh, for cannabis. Uh, the one that we grow in Nigeria is called Cannabis Sativa. Mm. It has a lot of medicinal use. And the only part of marijuana that people worry about is the part that has a THC. You know? And there's a marijuana that can be grown that we not even contain that. Marijuana or the hemp tree can also be used in place of cotton. So you're not looking to allow Nigerian use to Look. be smoking anyhow? <laughs> The, already, anybody that wants marijuana in Nigeria can get it. I don't have to worry about them. And I'm telling you, it's available anywhere you turn in this country. Marijuana has always been available. People deceive themselves. What I'm saying is that we have NDLA burning 1.5 trillion naira water of marijuana every year. Canada is in need of it. Let's pack it and send it to them. You know? The U.S. is in need of them. And we can make, and that can help us diversify our economy, by the way. The people of Ondo State can get $4 billion from marijuana in a year, a do State, and that triangle, the marijuana triangle, worried, Delta, are, do. are you worried at all that because you end up with a business in weed, yes. you may end up with um, a situation where in many ways you are enabling um, a bigger population to use marijuana. Is no, that a concern no. at all? No, no. It's not, it's not a concern because the medicinal value of marijuana, if you... Do you, you smoke? 
No, no, I've never smoked marijuana before. Yeah, but never. But let me let me let you keep talking. I've never, in fact, I've never smoked have, before. I've never smoked I, I, before. I have to come in. I've, here. Yeah, so, but, we're aware of the use of illicit drugs in this country, and it's a big epidemic over the last couple of years. But the government of President Muhammadu Buhari didn't do much in that direction because a report came in 2014 that there was never a time in history when these illicit drugs became cheaper, more available, and in their purest form than that. But the government did nothing in terms of prevention, actually, or enforcing, actually, children and other measures. Then a video came up from BBC as a documentary. You really and have that, very little time. And that, so. actually, made the Nigerian government to have a knee-jerk reaction. They banned the importation of codeine, I yeah. guess, and that created a balloon effect. Okay. Now people are sniffing gutters, are doing <laughs> others. So the best is actually to tackle the problem okay. head on from different angles. That okay, the corruption have. question for yes, corruption, is really important. Uh, what are you going yes. to do different we're from what's corruption happening with the use, And we don't have time. With the use of preventive measures, we talk about even paying people living wage so that they don't start thinking about stealing for the future. Mm. You know, there's need for enforcement, but most importantly, because corruption is carried out by the highest people in this country are the ones who are the most corrupt. There has to be consequences, you know, for people to know that it is not all right to be corrupt and get a shift and sit title or sit in front of the you church. You need the get... judiciary. We need... well, there are issues that we yes. have So the enforcement so... will help us even in the judiciary. Look, Nigeria has been playing around with corruption for a long time, but you know as an individual, I had been fighting corruption for the last 12 years on Sahara Reporters alone. The Chief Justice of Nigeria that is under trial, and I was the first person on Sahara Reporters who put out his account, saying that he has money that he can't even explain. Do you know what happened when so, I did so, it? The EFCC issued a statement that I was lying. Now, when it is politically expedient, mm -hmm. it's undergoing trial. Okay. So, you know what it is. So, Headsman clash, I wanted to say about land. Yes. There is enough land in Nigeria that you don't have to force anybody to give you land to do commercial ranching. What, why we call it commercial ranching is that if you give up your land, you are protected by law so that nobody takes it from you. you know? Listen, the redeemed church, every year, they slaughter over 20,000 cows when they have the Holy Ghost mm -hmm. uh, thing that they do, Congress that they do. They can have their own ranch. You know, I make fun of the people in the Southwest. If they kill a cow in the Southwest, only the blood will be left. They eat every part of it. But there's no ranch. But when Awulawa was around, he created a ranch in Akuno. The Calabar Ranch that is there today that is being used for, uh, for tourism used to be a cattle ranch. Okay, so, so it's nothing ask, new. We've had a ranches. A final question on yes. that before we go away. Are you at all concerned about the people whose way of life you would be disrupting, who are also Nigerian citizens? So the Fulanis that are used to grazing, yeah. what are, I, 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 are, you, what are the, the plans for them? No, because, no. you know, once you sort of take away that, that it's a, it's a we're, way of life. We're not, we're not taking away their way of life. I am doing this based on my conversation with a Fulani man or a number of Fulani people yeah. who have said that they will be comfortable okay. raising their cows in a ranch. And the reason why the Fulani man is walking around with 400 cows and his children and his wife is because he wants to make money, yeah. not because he wants to be lean. If they want to be lean, they can go to do marathons for us <laughs> at the Olympics. But it's about money and it's about innovation. A Fulani man can be in a ranch and still be walking around in the ranch on the back of a horse. And you would love to see him. They will even become a touristic center where okay. you can go and see the new Fulani man and his ranch and, you, and, you, his, and his country. You're aware that in the Mambila Plateau, mm -hmm. for yeah. example, yeah. ranches exist. Yes. Yeah. And yet, these issues that we've had are still ongoing. You've got clashes between Fulani ranch owners and Mambila farmers, yes. leading to hundreds of deaths. And these clashes happen, they die down, they happen historically. Yeah. Um, suggesting that perhaps the problem isn't that of people not being in ranches. What are your thoughts on this? No, no. So how many ranches do we have? And 
we have already discussed the issue of climate change. Yeah. You have a huge expanse of land also in what used to be Sambisa Forest and beyond and the Lake Chad region Almost that has been taken over by terrorists. That you are not taken back from them. Yeah. Our own position is that there will be a holistic solution that, you know, we drive Boko Haram out of the place, it frees yeah. up the land, almost the size of the state of Virginia in the U.S. Yeah. The people who want to go back to Sambisa Forest, for example, may not need ranch because the place is available for free for you to graze. But I'm saying that you can duplicate ranches that is not only in the Mambilla area. And you know the reason why the issue of Mambilla is different is that people are looking at it from who is superior to who. And this is where you start to talk about the security agencies at the top and how people view them you, when they intervene when there's a clash. When you Sadly, see a minister of defense acting Sadly, as if he's on the side of one side against the other, Sadly, you have a problem. Sadly, we've run out of time. Thank you. And I have to leave it here. Thank you so much, Mr. Shere. Thank you. And Mr. Hope you Yaku. Will Inauguration. Yes, and, and, and I'll be reminded there's a final important question, and I need a short show. Mm -hmm. If you lose, oh. will you accept the results of the elections? If elections are free and fair, there's no way we can lose.